This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Trust the rally? The Dow extends its win streak as trade tensions cool, but can the upward climb for stocks continue? Place your bets. Why the Supreme Court's ruling today could give cash-strapped states a new financial lifeline. Outliving your money. It's a big worry for those saving for retirement. But is it just a myth? Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, May 14th. And we do bid you good evening, everybody. Welcome eight straight. That's how many consecutive sessions the Dow has now logged gains, marking the average's longest win streak in eight months. An easing of trade tensions with China, optimism over corporate earnings and upcoming economic data all gave investors more reasons to buy, apparently, even if the buying today was relatively quiet. The Dow, when all was said and done, rose by 68 points, closed at 24,899. The Nasdaq was up by eight. The S&P added two. But can this mini upswing that we've seen the past couple of weeks turn into something bigger? Mike Santoli tackles that for us tonight. Will the third time be a charm? Stocks are up 4% in less than two weeks and are 6% above their April low, the third strong rally since the sharp market setback struck at the end of January. The previous two tries regained a bit more than half the value lost in the correction before stalling out close to current levels and sagging back toward the year's lows. Investors are now asking whether this recovery attempt can be trusted. There are a few reasons to believe this advance does have a better shot of holding up than the prior ones. For one, the best corporate earnings season in years is just about in the books, and the results now make stocks look a good deal less expensive than at the start of the year. The results were strong enough to support stocks through this period of rising bond yields, helping investors make peace with a 10-year Treasury near 3 percent. The market's own behavior has also been much more stable this time around, with measures of S&P 500 index volatility back near normal levels after months of elevated readings that suggested greater market risk. This rally is also fairly broad, and its leadership is encouraging. Small cap stock indexes tied closely to the U.S. economy are just about at a record high. Technology, financial, energy, and industrial shares are outperforming as well, which also sends a solid signal about growth. All these factors suggest this rally is on its way to earning back the benefit of the doubt for stock bulls, but not completely. It's unclear if the market will continue to take a further rise in interest rates or oil prices in stride. And while corporate profits exceeded most expectations in the first quarter, nagging doubts about the durability of the earnings boom remain. So investors can trust this rally for now, but need to verify that it can handle the possible challenges of this point in the economic cycle. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mike Santoli. As we mentioned, stocks traded higher today amid hopes of a potential breakthrough in trade tensions between the U.S. and China. The world's two largest economies may be close to reaching some type of deal ahead of a visit by China's vice premier to Washington this week. Kayla Taoshi has more. A key bargaining chip in the talks between the U.S. and China, removing barriers for Chinese telecom giant ZTE. President Trump saying he wants the company back in business fast tweeting today it's part of a larger deal being negotiated. This um, is part of a very complex relationship between the United States and China that involves economic issues, national security issues um, and the like. Um, and it's an issue of high concern for China. It's a sharp reversal from the multiple enforcement actions the administration has taken as intelligence agencies issued warnings about ZTE. Last March, Commerce fining the company $1.2 billion for violating Iran and North Korea sanctions. This unprecedented penalty reflects ZTE's premeditated, egregious scheme to evade U.S. law. In April, banning U.S. firms from supplying components to ZTE. This month, the Pentagon said ZTE was a security risk and prohibited the sale of devices on military bases. The president's about face meeting criticism from both sides of the aisle. New York Democrat Chuck Schumer. His policy seems designed for a new goal, make China great again. The toughest thing we could do, the thing that sent the shot across the bow to the Chinese, was taking tough action against actors like the ZTE network. Republican Senator Marco Rubio said the U.S. would be, quote, crazy to allow them to operate without tighter restrictions. Today, Secretary Ross suggested things had changed. ZTE 
uh, did do some inappropriate things. They've admitted to that. The question is, are there alternative remedies to the one that we had originally put forward? And that's the area we will be exploring very, very promptly. The White House declined to comment on what China would offer the U.S. in return if penalties on ZTE were relaxed. A source briefed on the matter says at least two options are on the table. The approval of a U.S. semiconductor merger and the reversal of tariffs on U.S. agriculture. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche in Washington. The price of crude oil continues to rise, and it's all about supply and demand. A new report from OPEC says the global glut of, gr of crude oil may be mostly gone. The oil cartel says that stockpiles in the developed world stand just 9 million barrels above the five-year average. OPEC also increased its forecast for demand this year while lowering its outlook for production, hence the continued rally. Oil traders today were also watching the deadly violence in Gaza between Israeli troops and Palestinians, marking the bloodiest day there since the 2014 war. Palestinians were protesting the opening today of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Price of domestic crude settled above $70 a barrel today. As oil prices rise, so do gas prices. One survey says the national average is inching towards $3 a gallon. And less money in people's pockets has traditionally been viewed as bad for the economy. But as Steve Leisman reports, that may no longer be the case. When oil prices used to rise in America, economists have always been quick to say it will drag down growth. But that looks to be changing. In a dramatic shift, some economists now think the scourge of higher oil prices will have only a negligible effect on U.S. growth. Some think it could even be zero. The reason? U.S. oil production has surged, making it now the number two world producer. That means less imports and more exports. And capital spending by oil companies is so great that it could offset the decline in consumer spending. Mike Faroli, chief U.S. economist with J.P. Morgan Chase, says, quote, we think the effect will round to a wash. Our prior modeling would likely have produced a slightly more adverse impact. Faroli says specifically a 0.2 percent decline in consumer spending will likely be offset by a 0.2 percent increase in capital spending. Comments by St. Louis Fed President James Bullard suggest the Fed is thinking the same way. It used to be a big oil shock was probably bad news for the U.S. economy, but now I think it's neutral. It hurts our uh, consumer side, but it helps us on the production side, and it more or less washes out at this point. So I think it's not what it used to be uh, to track oil prices for the U.S. economy. And John Riding of RDQ Economics says the biggest issue will be one of distribution. Higher oil prices amount to a wealth transfer from consumers to oil company shareholders and from oil consuming regions in the U.S. to oil producing regions, of which there are now many more. But this time, a lot more of the money stays in the United States. Economists we contacted said their new ideas may not hold if oil surges above $100 a barrel again. And one important negative, gas prices have an outsized impact on the American psyche. Sustained gas prices above $3 a gallon could undermine confidence, but there might be an offset to that, too. I think people are paying way too much attention to is our energy prices. Uh, energy prices going up, yes, are somewhat bad for the consumer, but the consumer has benefited from a tax cut. So will better growth and tax cuts and capital spending offset the impact of higher oil prices? That remains to be seen, but for now, some economists are doing a big rethink on the economics of big oil. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Meanwhile, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland said today that a shifting outlook for the economy may mean more interest rate increases than initially thought. Loretta Mester is a voting member of the central bank this year. She cited the continued economic expansion, but she also noted that inflation has yet to reach the central bank's 2 percent goal in a sustained way. Policymakers meet again next month. Thank you, Bill. The Supreme Court today opened the doors to legalize sports betting across the country. The decision could allow state governments to join what is a very lucrative industry. Eric Chemi has the details. We could start taking bets tomorrow. While it may not start tomorrow, a big change is coming to New Jersey. Sports betting. The operator of Monmouth Park Racetrack said there's no hard date as to when people can start placing their bets, but it's coming very, very soon. New Jersey is declaring victory in its six-year legal battle that went all of the way to the Supreme Court. The highest court in the land today overturned a 26-year-old federal law that had prevented states from legalizing sports gambling. 
it's not just New Jersey. The ruling is also a victory for any other state that wants to do the same thing, and a lot of them do. Over a dozen have already passed bills authorizing sports gambling. The stakes are huge. Right now, it's estimated that Americans spend about $150 billion a year on illegal sports gambling. Estimates are all over about how much of that will move to legal sports books. Deutsche Bank analysts think it could be a $4 billion opportunity by 2023, just from 13 states adopting it. State legislatures are looking forward to getting a shot at taxing those revenues. And executives within the industry see this all happening quickly. Really, it's kind of one word, and it's huge. I mean, people anticipated it would be overturned based on the questioning of the chief justices, but here it is. And I think you're going to see some very interesting events unfold fairly quickly. The decision could also reshape professional sports as we know it, bringing in more dollars to sports leagues, either through direct royalty payments, but also from a new class of sponsors, higher media ad rates, and a more engaged fan base. Imagine team jerseys with ads for casinos or gaming websites. More direct winners may be the technology servicers that many casinos hire to manage their sports books. State tax coffers could go up as well as each state takes a cut on bets. But some observers worry that all that money will increase the incentives for players to fix matches and throw games. And making it easier to play sports bets could make it easier for problem gamblers to get in over their heads. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eric Chemi. Investors cheered the decision, sending shares of stocks like Caesars Entertainment, Penn National, and Boyd higher. Time to take a look now at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. UPS was upgraded to buy from neutral today by Bank of America. The analyst cites UPS's plan to transform its network and the resulting potential for improving margins. Price target, $144. That stock rose fractionally to $116.34 today. CSX was upgraded to neutral from sell by Goldman Sachs. The analyst says CSX is insulated from some of the bigger challenges facing that industry right now. Price target now $60. Shares of CSX fell today to $62.90. Shares of Xerox were downgraded to neutral from overweight by J.P. Morgan. The analyst cites near-term risks to the stock following the termination of the planned merger with Fuji. The price target is $38. The stock fell 4% to 28.87. Twinkies maker Hostess Brand saw its rating lowered to hold from buy at Deutsche Bank. The analyst cites uncertainty over margin and profit improvement. The price target is 14. The shares fell nearly 4 percent to finish at 12.76. Still ahead, why the gold standard of retirement research says a widely held belief is more of a myth. Wall Street is upping its investment in the home flipping market. KKR is sinking a quarter of a billion dollars into a company that buys loans made to speculators who buy homes, renovate them, and sell them quickly, presumably for a profit. These kinds of loans, though, are not cheap. They command interest rates of between 8 and 12 percent and often have short 12-month maturities. One estimate has put borrowing by flippers at $15 billion this year, that's nearly 25% more than last year. And with investor cash now ruling the market, regular home buyers who need a mortgage are at a disadvantage. That's where a financial startup is stepping in and backing home buyers with cash. Diana Olek has more. In today's ultra competitive housing market, cash is king. Sellers would much rather close a deal quickly without the time and risk of dealing with the buyer's mortgage. But most buyers don't have cash, and that's where a tech-based startup, Ribbon, is looking to cash in. We've democratized the sense of capital to empower consumers to be able to enable any buyer to bid with cash. So buyers can now compete effectively in the open market against institutional investors, Wall Street capital, and very wealthy individuals. Ribbon is launching in the very hot Charlotte, North Carolina market. It's not a lender, but it does underwrite potential buyers to see how much mortgage they could qualify for. They also appraise the home the buyer wants. They then back the deal with the cash, so the seller is guaranteed the money regardless. If the buyer's mortgage doesn't come through, Ribbon buys the house and gives the buyer more time to get the mortgage 
and buy it back from Ribbon for the same price. The buyer can rent the home while they do this for up to a year. They pay Ribbon 1.95% of the price of the home. If the buyer never gets the loan or pulls out, Ribbon then sells the house to another investor. That frees up our capital to go help another consumer in the market. Ribbon is backed by Pete Flint, the founder of Trulia. Flint says while the first move for tech in real estate was to empower buyers and sellers with information on sites like Trulia, Zillow and Redfin, the next move is making the transaction of buying and selling a home a historically stressful experience easier. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. And you can read more about the startup backing buyers with cash on our website, nbr.com. Sears continues selling more assets or considers it. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The retailer has formed a special committee of independent board members to explore the possible sale of some assets, including its Kenmore appliance brand. CEO Eddie Lampert, who owns 30 percent of the company, has offered to buy Kenmore himself. The committee is evaluating that and other offers. Shares of Sears rose more than 6% a day to $3.65. There could be a management shakeup at Tesla. CEO Elon Musk said today he was launching a reorganization of the business to improve communication and trim activities not vital to Tesla's success. Musk also added that Tesla would be accelerating hiring for Model 3 production needs. Shares fell 3% to $291.97. And CBS is suing Sherry Redstone and her theater company National Amusements in an attempt to block Redstone's plan to merge CBS and Viacom. National Amusements controls both of those companies. CBS said the lawsuit was needed to prevent the Redstone family and National Amusements from breaching their fiduciary duties and harming CBS shareholders by forcing a merger at below market value. The CBS board is going to meet this week to discuss substantially cutting national amusements voting power. CBS shares finished up 2 percent a day to 53.65. Meanwhile, shares of Viacom went the other, other direction down about 5 percent to 28.74. Shares of Symantec recovered some of the losses it suffered last week when the software company said an internal audit could cause a restatement of financial results. Today, the company gave investors more details, saying that a former employee made accusations against the company related to its financial reporting, stock trading, plans and retaliation. Investors seem to like the transparency. They sent shares up more than 9 percent to 21.40. After the bell, the data center operator Switch reported a steeper than expected drop in profits as higher labor costs hurt results. Revenue edged higher and topped estimates, but investors didn't seem to care. The shares were initially lower in after hours trading, but finished the regular session up nearly 1 percent to $15.47. All right, we've all heard the ominous warnings about a looming retirement crisis here in the U.S. for about half of Americans who have not saved enough for their golden years. But a new report from the Employment Benefit Research Institute now suggests that things may not be as dire as feared. Lori Lucas is the president and CEO of EBRI. She joins us tonight to talk about the findings. And you, you studied, what, 20,000 retirees over uh, the period of time that they are retired. And during the first 20 years of their retirement, you found that they spent much less than anticipated, yes? Yeah, that's right. We were looking at actual spending patterns in retirement, and depending on the amount of non-housing assets people had going into retirement, they were spending only about 12 to 27 percent of those assets through the 20 years of their retirement. And why is that? I mean, is it fear that they're going to run out of money, or do they, they live a much more modest lifestyle? Which, which one? Or both. Yeah, if, yeah. If you look at some of the people we were uh, the twenty, uh, the the people in the uh, small uh, asset group had about thirty thousand in assets, and they were also not spending down their money in retirement. So the, it, presumably they had things that they needed to spend money on, and they they don't have that much money, but they're still preserving their assets, and so it does seem to be that fear may be a really strong driver of why people won't spend their money in retirement. But I don't want to give anybody a false sense of, of uh, the, the idea that they're not going to outlive their money. There are people who do outlive their money, right? Yeah, in that um, small asset group uh, with the $30,000, uh, about a third of those people did spend on their assets. But interestingly, even in that group, 
a third also grew their assets over that 20, you know, nearly 20 year period. So very, it's a, it's a very inefficient use of that, uh, of, of spending down assets for that group. And when they add to their assets, is it because they're taking part time jobs, the, the return on their investments? Why are they adding to their assets or how are they doing it? So they're just basically leaving their assets as a nest egg. And, and, and perhaps they're getting a great sense of financial security just having that little amount of money to fall back on and just basically living off of Social Security. I learned a new word today, Lori, decumulation. I mean, we spend mm -hmm. our years so uh, much accumulating uh, money and assets, but it's our retirement years when we are expected to decumulate and we're not doing it as much. I guess we, it, we adapt, right? Yeah, I mean, you think about it, people have spent their whole lives saving and, and it, it being pounded into their heads to save and not spend. And it's really hard to flip that switch and spend when you, there's so much uncertainty about how long you're going to live in retirement. Are you going to have a catastrophic health care event that you need to have money for? So you can understand, you know, the psychology of it being very difficult to spend on those savings. Indeed. Lori, thank you for joining us tonight. Lori Lucas with the Employment Benefit Research Institute. Thank you. Coming up, why deducting charitable donations may be harder under the new tax law and how you can hold on to that popular break. The sale of the century certainly lived up to its name. The auction of the Peggy and David Rockefeller collection has ended, and it's smashed all records. Robert Frank tallies the winning bids for us tonight. Would you like 53 gentlemen on the aisle there? It was billed as the sale of the century, and it lived up to its promise. The collection of Peggy and David Rockefeller was expected to fetch more than $500 million over the course of last week at Christie's. And when the hammers fell for the last time and the online oh, bids so closed, like the total be, reached $832 million. It was the largest auction ever for a single collection, almost double the previous record. And bidders came from 53 countries, all vying for the piece of that Rockefeller history. And more than half of the buyers had never bought from Christie's before. The big paintings, the Picasso, the Monet, and the Matisse, accounted for much of that total. But many items blew past their estimates as the new rich wanted the taste of the old. David Rockefeller's money clip, also once owned by his brother Lawrence, was estimated at $1,000. It sold for $75,000. And the family picnic set given to them by the King of Morocco was estimated at five to 10000 That went for 212000 And Napoleon's sugar bowl and dessert service estimated at around $200,000 went for $1.8 million. And the good thing is that all the proceeds will go to charity. So Harvard and the Museum of Modern Art will each get $100 million. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund will get $250 million. And other beneficiaries include the Council on Foreign Relations and the American Farmland Trust. The art auctions roll on this week as Sotheby's and Christie's go back to the sales room with more than $1.5 billion worth of art. We'll see if there is more energy and more money left in those auction paddles. Robert Frank, Nightly Business Report. Wonderful story. But you know, charitable giving isn't just for the Rockefeller estate. There are many ways to give generously and earn a tax break for yourself. But there are some new rules that go along with the new tax code. So once again, our senior personal finance correspondent, Sharon Epperson, is here to save the day. <laughs> it's good to see you as always, Good to Sharon. be here. So what is a smart way for us to donate to charity, given the new landscape that we're in? One way to think about giving to charity and give generously is to set up a donor-advised fund. It's a fund that works kind of like your personal savings account for charitable giving. And you can contribute cash or stock or mutual funds. You could even contribute real estate or even artwork if you're able to do so. And you are able to take an immediate tax deduction for the money that you contribute at that time in that tax year. But you can wait and give to certain charities over time smaller amounts of whatever you may have in that fund. Who runs these funds? I mean, who, who do I call if I want to start setting this They're up? run by nonprofits, community foundations, or also charitable arms of a financial service. Services firm. So the largest 
donor advised fund is actually the Fidelity Charitable Giving Fund. Schwab also has a charitable giving fund. And the way that you can do it, the way to set it up is pretty simple. You can start with Fidelity or Schwab at least with $5,000. You put that into the account and then you're able to pay an administrative fee of $100 and probably some management fees depending on how it's invested. Right. And then you can give up to $50,000, sorry, $50, only $50 at a time to whatever charity you'd like. So you can give a small donation of $50 or you can give a larger donation, but you can start with just $5,000 and take that tax break right at that time. In the last couple seconds we have, how does the new tax code impact these funds, if at all? Well, it certainly does impact it because you have to itemize your deductions in order to take that charitable contribution, a deduction for that and a tax write-off for that. So bundling your giving, giving a big amount like in a donor advised fund one year and maybe not giving another year may be a way to take that charitable contribution and with the increase in the standard deduction still have amount that's over that amount so that it makes sense to itemize. You did it again. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Sharon. Sure. As always, My pleasure. Sharon Epperson. You always have me taking notes, that's for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Before we go, here's another look at the day on Wall Street. The Dow made it eight straight gains today with a gain of 68 points. It was much higher than that earlier. The Nasdaq was up by eight. The S&P added two points today. And that does it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.